Hi, Stu from Music Technology here. A while ago, a viewer asked me to explain how my adjustable sawtooth generator that you've seen in some of my other videos actually works. It sounds like this. And it can go into LFO territory as well if we take it right down to there. which is useful for controlling other circuits. So I first have to give a shout out to Alan Yoke, who designed this original circuit. And what is in my box is Alan's design that it goes through on his videos. Now, Alan has his own YouTube channel and he's better known as W2AEW on YouTube. And his channel is chock full of circuit tutorials, back to basics videos. I've learned so much myself from watching those videos. So a massive shout out to Alan W2AEW. Go and check out his channel and I'll link the particular sawtooth video below. Now I'm still going to do this video and hopefully do some other things that Alan didn't do in his video. So we're going to spend some time in Volstad, the circuit simulator, looking at simulations of different parts of this circuit. And I'll also put together a few little breadboards so we can see parts of the circuit in isolation. And we'll combine them at the end and come back to the adjustable sawtooth generator. At its heart, it's based on four principles. Charging and discharging a capacitor but doing it through a constant current source to create a linear ramp rather than an exponential curve. We can control the discharge and the charge cycle using diodes arranged as a switch, which I'll be able to show you with the LED so you can visualize what's going on. And then we can compare the voltage on the capacitor to a reference voltage, and then we can switch the diode switch in one direction or the other using that information. Now, in order to do that effectively, we have to employ a comparator circuit and also introduce some positive feedback, which creates hysteresis. So these are the four principles involved. Now, what we'll do is we'll break down each part of our adjustable sawtooth circuit and we'll build them block by block into the final thing. So here we are in the circuit simulator at fullstad.com. And you can try this for yourself at fullstad.com. I'll put a link below in the description to this exact file that you can upload and have a play with yourself. Now, this is the entire sawtooth generator simulated in this software. And what we're going to do is we're going to break down each of these components from the current sources to the diode switch to the capacitor and the op amp with hysteresis control and look at what each of these does in isolation. And we're gonna come back to this circuit at the end and see how it all operates together to create our adjustable sawtooth generator. At the very heart of this circuit, we're simply charging and discharging capacitor. So here I am just using a square wave of one hertz to charge and discharge the capacitor and it's creating this shark fin like waveform because it doesn't charge and discharge in a linear manner. Now in order to create a triangle or a sawtooth, we need it to charge and discharge in a linear manner. And the way we achieve that is we actually charge and discharge the capacitor through a constant current source instead. So I thought I would set up what we have in the circuit simulator as software on a breadboard here. So I've got a non-polarized capacitor. It might look like a polarized one, but it's a special electrolytic with NP written on it, which means non-polarized. And I've just set up a square wave from the function generator of 440 Hertz going into this plus or minus five volts. And let's take a look at the oscilloscope and see what that looks like. So here we are, we're feeding roughly 440 hertz, 10 volts peak to peak into our capacitor and it's creating this waveform on the oscilloscope, which is like a shark fin waveform. We don't want this, of course, we want a nice linear ramp up and a nice linear ramp down. And the way we get that is by using a constant current source. 
So as a quick demo, what I've done is added two current sources of 100 microamps each and this simple switch that I can switch between charging and discharging this capacitor. Now if you watch the oscilloscope at the bottom when I set this running, you'll see that it creates a linear ramp up and a linear ramp down as it charges and discharges because the current is now constant. And then discharging also a linear ramp. So this is at the heart of our circuit. So now we need a way of controlling whether the capacitor is discharging or charging. And the way we do that is by using diodes arranged in this configuration. It's acting as a switch. On the low part of the cycle from our function generator here is for biasing this diode and this diode and creating this path allowing the capacitor to discharge. And if I speed this up slightly, we'll see that it gets to the bottom of that cycle in a second. And now, because we're on the other half of the cycle, it's for biasing this diode and this diode and allowing our capacitor to charge up. Now we don't want this function generator here what we want to do is use the voltage on the capacitor here to actually control the switching of the circuit. So just as an addition to what's going on in the Falstad simulation software, I thought I'd throw together a quick breadboard here, but I've used LEDs because they're a great way of visualizing what's going on in the diodes. So you can see here, I'm feeding nine volts in through this resistor. And then we're controlling these LEDs or this LED switch via a square wave signal from my function generator, which is at about 1.5 Hertz in this case. This allows us to visualize which part of our dual pole dual throw switch is active at any one moment. And you can see this reflected in which LEDs run. When this is for bias, so is this. And the same is true between these two here as well. In order to control our diode switch, we need to compare the voltage on the capacitor to a reference voltage. In order to do that, we can use a comparator. Now I'm using an op-amp, but you can actually use a comparator chip as well to achieve this. Here we have two voltage dividers. You're probably familiar with these. So this has two of the same value. It's gonna give me 4.5 volts on here, which will be perfectly 4.5 volts in this simulation. And here I have a 10K potentiometer and it's set precisely in the middle, 5K each side. So it's given me 4.5 volts. Now I've removed this 3K9 resistor for a moment for the circuit, just so we can see the operation of the comparator first of all. So this is 4.5 volts, this is 4.5 volts, the output is 4.5 volts. And that is all reflected down here in the oscilloscope. Everything's at 4.5 volts. Now let me take my resistance to zero so we get the full nine volts going through the circuit and you can see the op-amp output has now dropped to zero volts. Now if I take it in the other direction, so I'm grounding it basically, you can see the op-amp output has gone high now and jumped up to around nine volts. Now this is great, but watch what happens when I return it to the center. Everything's gone back to 4.5 volts and we don't want this in our circuit. We want it to get to a point where it switches and then we don't want it to switch again until there's a significant change in the voltage. Otherwise, if you had a signal that was kind of flitting around 4.5 volts, you get all sorts of interesting jumps going on between 0, 4.5 and 9 volts. Now in order to ensure that it doesn't do that, we can employ some positive feedback. And this creates an effect called hysteresis. So if I reinstate this resistor here, it doesn't really matter if these are 3K9, they could be 4K7s as long as they're all the same. Now watch what happens. So if I take my resistance down to 0, the op-amp goes into its low state, starts sinking current, but note that the orange line has now moved to three volts. So the threshold has changed. So now it won't switch back until I get down to three volts. So that's 1.5 volts lower than before. So if I do that, bring it down, you'll see when the red line crosses the orange line, it switches. 
Now look what's happened to our threshold, the orange line. It's jumped up to six volts. And it's done that because of this feedback resistor. So having this threshold that moves based on the state of your circuit is called hysteresis. And it's really useful in this application and other applications as well. So let me just move that so it crosses that threshold and then the threshold moves and I have to actually cross the threshold in order to switch the circuit. If I'm flitting around 4.5 volts, it's gonna stay the same until I dip below or above, depending on the cycle that I'm in. In order to help us further visualize what we've seen in the circuit simulator, I've thrown together the op amp as comparator with hysteresis on the breadboard. We've got our voltage divider here, our feedback resistor here, providing that hysteresis. Here's my potentiometer, and I've added an LED with current limiting resistors to the output so we can see what's going on. Now, I have actually used 4K7 resistors in this circuit. See, they're all the same here, because that's what I had in Stark. So now, if I turn this potentiometer to turn the LED on, you'll see it's pointing in this direction over here. Now, it's not until I get all the way down here that it turns off. So from about here to about here, we've got that zone where our threshold moves from there back up to there. And I actually have to turn it all the way up there to turn it back on. And the threshold has moved to down here again, and I'll have to move it down there to turn it off. This is a really useful circuit for many applications, but here we're using it to control our diode switch. So we can combine all of those elements now, charging and discharging our capacitor through constant current sources. We can switch cycles using a diode switch, and we can compare the voltage on the capacitor with a reference voltage and use that to switch our switch here so we can charge or discharge the capacitor. So starting on the left here, we've got our charge and discharge controls, um, our constant current sources, and they are charging and discharging the capacitor at the heart of our circuit through this diode switch, which is switching between the cycles. Now, in order to switch this, we're actually looking at the voltage on this capacitor and comparing it to a reference voltage. And when it falls below a certain voltage, we're switching it in the other direction and it has to charge up more than that voltage, remember, because we've got this positive feedback, which produces hysteresis, that then switches the diode switch in the other direction. And because we're charging this up through those constant current sources and discharging it as well, we get this triangle or linear waveform. Now, the only other thing I've added to this simulation is this buffer on the output of the capacitor. This is where we take our adjustable sawtooth output from. And the reason for that is we don't want to load this part of the circuit here. So we just buffer it using a voltage follower. They're both the same thing. We talk about buffers in audio, uh, but this is an op amp setup as a voltage follower. So any voltage on here will be the same on the output but whatever we plug into here won't affect what comes before it. These are used a lot in audio circuits. We can also take our square wave with variable duty cycle out of here as well, give us a square wave oscillator from zero to nine volts approximately. Depending on your op amp, it probably won't be that much because this is simulating a rail to rail op amp. And then our triangle wave, which will be from about three volts to six volts, but again, it varies based on the capacitor and what you're using here as your comparator. Now, in order to actually make this adjustable, what we need to do is adjust the duty cycle of the square wave and also at the same time, the current either being sourced or sank out of this capacitor. So here you'll see I've added two potentiometers, one here and one here, as in Alan's original circuit, and we can adjust them over here with the slider. So if I take one all the way down and one all the way up, and you have a look at the effect that has on both the square wave's duty cycle and also the sawtooth waveform, you can see now it's charging quickly and discharging more slowly. And if I do the opposite, you'll see that it has the opposite effect. Now also you can affect the frequency of course. So if I take them both up onto full, we get a lower frequency 
And if they're both on the low setting, we get a much higher frequency. So this not only controls the adjustment of how fast it charges or discharges, it can also control the frequency as well of the sawtooth. Now at the moment, we've got approximately, um, I haven't got it stated here, but I seem to remember it was something like 40 Hertz. So let's have a look in properties and show frequency. 35.47 Hertz. Now in order to change that, we can also change this capacitor here. So let me take this up to a 10U instead. And that has slowed down our output to about 11 hertz. So we're getting into LFO territory now. So we can also use this as a sawtooth LFO as well as a the basis for a VCO. So I've built my final version into this box here that you've seen in other videos. And I've got the current source potentiometers here. And I've also added a range control, which switches between different capacitors to give me different frequency ranges. Coming out of this black wire here, I have that variable duty square wave and then the sawtooth waves coming out of this purple wire here. So you'll see that's reflected in the blue square wave on the oscilloscope and the yellow sawtooth wave. So I can adjust each leg. Like so. So we can go all the way from this type of waveform right through to triangle and then this type of waveform. And then we've got different frequency ranges from low frequencies to higher frequencies on this range control here, all of which are adjustable with these controls. Now I hope that built on Alan's already excellent explanation of this circuit definitely check out his video. It's linked below in the description. He goes into much more detail and some maths associated with this circuitry too. Hopefully taking the approach of using a circuit simulator to see what's going on with the current flow and voltages and also breaking some of those sub circuits out onto breadboards and using LEDs to visualize would have helped you understand this circuit further. If you like this kind of content, hit like, give us a subscribe. I'll be back with more guitar pedal circuits, audio electronics and other things of that nature. I'm Stu from Music Technology. I'll catch you soon.